Now, last week I provided additional evidence of the link between instrumental music and Jewish temple worship generally and the sacrifices specifically. Now, this connection, it's indicated in Scripture, and it was recognized by Josephus, by the early Christians, by ancient rabbis, and is recognized by modern scholars. I pointed out that many theologians of the early church and theologians from the Reformation to the present, that they understood that the New Covenant's abrogation of temple worship, that it rendered inappropriate the use of musical instruments in Christian worship. Using instruments in worship was worship according to the Old Covenant shadow rather than the more spiritual worship instituted by Christ. And here's a quote I've read to you before from Benno Zwiedem, who is an associate professor of church history at a university in South Africa, where he says, the New Testament church considered that a spirit-filled human voice was sufficient and that she was no longer in need of the musical crutches of the Old Testament dispensation of shadows. So this is how you had theologians then in the Reformation today who understood that effect that the, that the New Covenant's abrogation of Jewish temple worship rendered inappropriate worship with instruments in the New Covenant because that was worship according to the shadows. I then explained that singing continued in Christian worship despite its association with the temple because it, it, with, singing differs from playing instruments in spiritually significant ways. Specifically, singing like all speech. Singing is an internal, immediate expression of the inner man, of the spirit, whereas instrumental music, it's an external, non-communicative sound made with an inanimate, man-made object. So the former is ideally suited for worship of God who is spirit, whereas the latter is not. Our voice is the instrument of our spirit. Our voice is the instrument of our spirit, and our praise is our spiritual sacrifice. Now, to repeat the quote from Everett Ferguson, he said, vocal expressions are peculiarly well-suited to the expression of spiritual worship, to the expressing of what comes from the human spirit through the spirit of God. They are rational, not in the sense of non-emotional, but as proceeding from and appealing to the highest of human nature. The whole self, including the emotions, is involved in Christian worship, but the mind, reason, is to be in control. Instrumental music can express feelings and emotions. Vocal music can express the will and intellect. The latter is better suited for the communion of spirit with spirit. In vocal music, there's an immediate contact. In instru instrumental music, there's an intermediary. The voice is much more a matter of oneself than any other gift of praise can be. Vocal music thus best corresponds to the nature of one's relationship to God. And I think that expresses well what I'm trying to say in this idea, this distinction between instrumental music and praise vocally. Now, in this final class, I thought it would be helpful to address some of the claims that are made by those who promote the use of musical instruments in Christian worship. And after I address those claims, I will remind you of the relevance of Romans 14 and 15 to this and other matters of worship. And then if I have time, I'll say a word about my use of early Christian writers. But regarding the claims that are made by the proponents of instrumental music in Christian worship, First, a person who teaches, like I do, a person who teaches that instrumental music in Christian worship is wrong, that it's contrary to God's will, sometimes will be accused of majoring in minors, of focusing on a relatively insignificant topic. Now, whether somebody's majoring or focusing on a topic, that depends, of course, on how much time he devotes to it. Instrumental music can no doubt become a hobby horse, you know, a pet issue that one rides incessantly. But the danger to the modern, modern church is neglect of this subject, not obsession over it. 
You see, that's where the danger lies. As I said, in the, my experience has been that we almost never teach on this topic. And comments that some of you have made to me uh, indicate that's your experience as well. As I said, I've been in the church for almost 40 years. And that's certainly my experience is that we almost never talk about it. Now, the truth of the matter is that some of these critics, they don't want any teaching that instrumental music is unacceptable in Christian worship. They simply don't want that taught at all. So they use the charge of majoring in minors to discourage people from tackling the subject. See, not teaching about it, that plays into their acceptance and promotion of instrumental worship because it says, it implies that it's insignificant to God. It's not worth talking about. It's not worth teaching. But if, as I have endeavored to explain over the last however many weeks, if instrumental music is in, in worship is indeed contrary to God's will, then we need to teach on it. See, we need to teach on it regardless of accusations that doing so reflects a warped spiritual perspective. We can't allow those who don't like the message who don't want the message to silence us by impugning our spirituality, by saying that, well, you're a Pharisee or something like that. If this is correct, if this is God's will, then we need to teach it. And so that's what I've endeavored to do. Second, one who teaches that using instrumental music in Christian worship is contrary to God's will will sometimes be accused of being divisive. But as I've explained, a cappella the a cappella position, that's the historical stance of the church. It's the historical stance of the church, and it's one that excludes no one. As all people are agreed that it's acceptable to praise God without instruments. Instrumentalists, on the other hand, they're the relative newcomers whose practice excludes those who believe it's contrary to God's will to worship with instrumental music. So who's being divisive? That's the question. Who's being divisive? I mean, one would think that if the instrumentalists were as passionate about unity as they claim to be, that they would surrender their use of the instrument to achieve it. I mean, after all, for them, it's an optional practice. It's a mere preference. But for us, it's a matter of God's will. It's a matter of conscience. But instead, they cling to the use of instruments. They evangelize about it. They introduce instruments into churches. And then they accuse people like me of dividing the church when I explain why I think they're wrong. So it's a nice game. You know, you get one side of the argument that gets pressed. And if you say, I don't think that's right, well, then you're being divisive. There's something wrong with that. But that's how it goes down. So by my lights, the divisive shoe is on the other foot. Now third, I mentioned some weeks ago that most proponents of instrumental music in Christian worship, they accept the scholarly consensus that Christians didn't use instrumental music for many centuries. A few, however, largely on the internet, they deny that scholarly consensus. They claim there's abundant evidence of Christians worshiping with instruments throughout the church's first millennium. You know, oh, oh, all over the place you see that. Now that's incorrect. And I explain why that's not true. In this online paper, if you go to my website, which is theoutlet.us, there are a number of tabs there. I have different categories of things. If you click on the Bible studies tab, then there's brings up a bunch, links to a bunch of different articles. And if you'll click the link for the article assessing the evidence offered for the use of musical instruments in early Christian worship, I address 21 claims where people say, no, you can see here, you can see it's here. And I go through each one of them. And I, I think, demonstrate that the claim that they, that they show instruments were used is false. So you have at it and see if you want to you dig in. I just didn't have the time in this class to run through because I, I don't know, it's like 30 pages so just for that one topic, I can't, you know, derail the whole thing and go off and chase all of that. But I've already done it. You can go read it. 
And so I can just point to it and save time that way. As I said, if there was persuasive evidence, just think about this. If there was persuasive evidence of instrumental worship in the early church, then the scholarly consensus wouldn't exist. If scholars can go and look and you say, okay, uh, I see here that yes, in fact, they're using instruments in the early church, then it would not be the scholarly consensus that the church didn't use instrumental music for like 900 years. You see, particularly when you understand that this consensus is across a broad theological spectrum. It is not a consensus of just one section of the theological spectrum. It includes many uh, groups and fellowships that use instruments today. So, you know, that's a protection against bias, the theological breadth. And so that wouldn't exist if that were right. So that's a clue that something's wrong. And if you go and read, I think you'll see why. Uh, If you'll read what I say about it, you'll see what's wrong. Is that these things are just jumping to conclusions that aren't warranted. All right, fourth thing. So that's the third thing. And and things that people who, who, uh, proponents of instrumental music and Christian worship, things that they claim. Fourth, one sometimes hears the claim that the use of the Greek word solo in the New Testament to refer to Christian singing. It's used five times, four verses, twice in one verse. It's in uh, Romans 15, 9, 1 Corinthians 14, 15, Ephesians 5, 19, and James 5, 13. But you sometimes hear this claim that the use of the word solo in the New Testament to refer to Christian singing that it indicates that instrumental music is in fact acceptable in Christian worship, that this is the the very use of that word carries the notion of the acceptability of instrumental worship. And though that that's wrong, that's incorrect. Though the word did in fact centuries before it originally referred to the plucking of a stringed instrument. That's how the word began its journey, but Ferguson and others have shown conclusively that by the first century, the word could mean simply sing without any implication of instrumental accompaniment. And that's why it's defined, the word solo is defined in the standard Greek lexicon, which is Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich, as meaning, quote, to sing songs of praise with or without instrumental accompaniment. Now that means that the word can have either connotation. See, depending on the context, not that it must have both connotations in every context. It's not uh, sing songs of praise with and without. It's with or without depending on the context. And that's important. Now maybe an illustration will help get across the point I'm trying to make with that. In American vernacular, hot dog refers to a smooth textured sausage of minced, uh, minced beef or pork with or without a bun. Now a request for me to pick up some hot dogs when I'm on my way to the meat market refers to the item without a bun. Whereas a request for me to pick up some hot dogs when I'm on my way to a concession stand refers to the item with a bun. The context determines whether the bun is included in the meaning. And if I can press the point in terms of this discussion of instrumental worship, if I belong to a group that was opposed to eating grain products like buns, if I belong to such a group as that, And in a letter to my fellow members, I refer to their eating hot dogs. Well, it would be silly for somebody to argue that our group accepts eating buns because hot dog refers to a smooth textured sausage with or without a bun. You see, my reference would obviously mean they were eating them without a bun, not that they were eating them both ways. So if you wind up saying, well, it means... You know, uh, with or without, therefore, no, it's context. It means with or without. And when I write that, it would mean without. And so I hope you can understand that. In the context of early Christian worship, solo is rightly understood to refer to singing without accompaniment. 
As Andrew Lincoln says in his commentary on Ephesians, Andrew Lincoln is an internationally respected New Testament scholar, has nothing to do with churches of Christ as far as I know. And in his commentary on Ephesians, he says, although its original meaning involved plucking a stringed instrument, solo here means, in Ephesians 5, 19, to make music by singing. So there is no reference in this verse to instrumental accompaniment. As Ferguson and others have shown, it simply means singing. It simply means singing. Clinton Arnold, who's another well-known New Testament scholar, he likewise says in his commentary in 2010 on Ephesians, he says, some have argued that solo implies the use of stringed instruments. It is true that the original meaning of the verb solo referred to the plucking of strings, but it certainly does not carry that meaning into all of its usages, with or without. And in referring to Christian singing, it means without. I mean, the absence of any implied acceptance of instruments in the New Testament uses of solo, it's evident from the fact that the church fathers, these Greek-speaking church fathers, that they vehemently and uniformly rejected instrumental music in worship. See, these Greek-speaking theologians, they obviously did not understand the use of the word solo in the New Testament to be an indication that instruments were acceptable. If they had, in other words, if any of them had understood solo in the New Testament as used by the Spirit of God to mean that instruments were implicitly acceptable, then they would have been obliged to say how they opposed instruments while the Spirit of God said they were acceptable. You see, they would have been obliged to say, well, here's why I oppose them when they are accepted by the Spirit of God. Nobody does that. Why don't they do that? They don't do that because they recognize that the use of solo doesn't carry that connotation. Okay? So that's important. You hear these kinds of things said, and said boldly sometimes, and in ignorance. And so the word simply means sing when it's used in the New Testament examples. That's something important, I think, to hold on to. Now, fifth, one time, fifth thing that, it, that is said that I want to address, one sometimes hears that passages in Revelation, that they indicate that God desires or accepts worship from Christians in the form of instrumental music, But that's not true. That's incorrect. Indeed, again, if God expressed approval of instruments by Christians in Revelation, then certainly some of the early theologians would have recognized that fact. But instead, what are the church for? Vehemently and uniformly, they all condemned instrumental music. So you would think that if Revelation indicates that Christians, it's acceptable for Christians, somebody would have picked up on that. But they didn't. Now, why didn't they? They didn't because Revelation doesn't indicate that. Okay, just as they didn't think Revelation indicated, I think that's correct. I think they were reading it properly. Now, the kathara, which is an instrument that's often translated harp, it's mentioned in three verses in Revelation. It's mentioned in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, Revelation 14, verse 2, and Revelation 15, verse 2. And in the heavenly vision... In Revelation chapter 5, when the lamb who appeared to have been slain, when he takes the scroll from the right hand of the one seated on the throne, well, then you have the four living creatures. They fall down. The four living creatures and the 24 elders, who probably are angelic beings, they fall down before the lamb. You see, in each Each of the prostrate 24 elders is said in chapter 5, verse 8, to have a harp and bowls of incense. Now, the plural bowls, you know, they have a harp and bowls of incense, plural. The plural bowls, that can be understood as being distributed among the 24 elders so that each holds only one bowl. You could understand it that way. In fact, the New Jerusalem Bible translates it that way. But in any event, each one has at least a harp and one bowl. 
And so here they are, prostrate, holding a harp and one bowl. So they're obviously not playing the harps. They're on the ground. They're on the ground and they're holding one or more bowls in addition to a harp. Now the last clause of verse 8, it explains what these objects symbolize. They are the prayers of the saints. You see, the prayers are pictured in the vision as being put before the Lamb by these prostrate heavenly beings. They're on the ground, each having a harp and at least one bowl of incense, and there they are setting them out there. And so they are the prayers. Now, many people claim that it's only the incense. It's only the incense that represents or symbolizes the prayers, but I think that's incorrect. Not only would, it, would restricting the explanatory clause to the incense leave the harp without any explanation. It seems asymmetrical. You see, he said, so each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which things are the prayers? So if you're going to say the bowls of incense or the incense represents the prayers of the saints, well, what about the harp? You see, you've only accounted for one. And that seems to be an odd asymmetry. So right away, I'm suspicious that that one's not being left out. But not only do you have that, you have the fact that I'm going to briefly go into the Greek weeds. Okay? But this is going to be a brief foray, but I want to point something out to you. If you look here in the way this works, this, this relative pronoun, which, okay, or which things, in Greek, there's a grammatical rule, rule of concord, that this relative pronoun will match what it, what it, uh, its antecedent, that to which it refers in gender and number. Okay, so in Greek, you have the, the nouns are gendered. You see, you have masculine, feminine, and neuter. And so this pronoun, it's going to match the gender and number of the noun to which it refers. Okay, so if you look here, you see which things, it's a feminine plural. All right, incense is a neuter plural. So by normal Greek grammar, it cannot refer to the incense. It must refer either to the bowls, which is a feminine plural, or to the harp and the bowls, because if you've got a feminine plural and a feminine singular, well, you know, you should just have another that's already plural. So it refers to either the bowls, not the incense, the bowls or the bowls and the harp. Now, is it impossible for it to refer to uh, the incense? It's not impossible. There is an exception to the grammatical rule, something called attraction. So it is possible that it does in fact refer to the incense, grammatically speaking, and that it, that it winds up being feminine plural because it's attracted to the feminine plural prayers on the other side, okay? But that's an exception, you see, and you only have to go there if you are assuming, no, it has to refer to the incense. It has to refer to the incense. Well, if it had to refer to the incense, then you would have a grammatical way of saying that. But why think it has to refer to the incense and not to the bowls and the harps? Why think that? Well, what leads a lot of people to, to think that is they say, no, it has to refer to the incense because in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, it indicates or demonstrates that it is the incense that represents the prayers. But I think that's misguided because the incense in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, is not used metaphorically for the prayers. It does not represent the prayers. It is offered with the prayers. So I think that's a mistake to, to read that and then say, okay, over here in five, it has to be the incense that represent the prayers. David Allen in his commentary on Revelation, he says, Revelation 8, 3 and 4 distinguishes between incense and prayer and does not treat the former as a metaphor for the latter. That's obvious if you'll just read it. But I wanted you to see that I'm not alone in recognizing that. So, you, you see, if you're not driven to insist that it's the incense, and it would be a mistake to be driven to insist that from Revelation chapter 8, 
Well, then why? Why go to this exception? Why not just take what you have here, take the feminine plural as referring to the bowls and the harp? That makes, to me, that's, that's the simplest grammatical idea. And then there's another thing about attraction that seems to be, I don't know how much I want to spend on this, but there are manuscripts, okay, in which the feminine plural which things has been changed to a neuter plural. Okay, now that could have simply been an, an error, or it could have been a scribe who said, look, somebody earlier on dropped the ball and made a mistake in copying this, and I'm going to correct it back to what it originally was, he thought. And so he makes it, he changes it from a feminine plural to a neuter plural, thinking that it referred to the incense. But why do I bring that up? Because if he did that, then that shows he didn't have much confidence in the grammatical exception of attraction. <clears throat> he felt like if it was going to refer to the incense, it had to be changed, you see, to be a neuter plural. He didn't say, well, of course, it's, it's a matter of attraction. All right, I'm just saying to you that the normal rules of grammar would say this applies to either bowls or to bowls and the harp. And I'm thinking it's better to understand it as referring to the, to the bowl of incense and the harp that these prostrate heavenly beings set before the Lamb, it refers to them and they are symbols of the saints' prayers in both their spoken and sung forms, which are the prayers of the saints. I think it's referring, these two things are static symbols of the prayers of the saints in both their spoken and sung forms. You say, well, what do you mean referring to songs as prayers? Well, that's not unusual at all, is it? I mean, Psalm 42, 8, it, it specifically there it refers to uh, a song it identifies. A song is identified with a prayer right there in 42, 8. And in Psalm 72, 20, it declares the prayers of David, the son of, of Jesse, are ended. Okay, implying that his preceding psalms, his preceding songs, well, what were they? They were prayers. And you see, prayers, many psalms, which were, of course, sung, they're identified as prayers. It is God-directed speech. You see, it is God-directed speech. So it's not at all odd to see songs as sung prayers. So that's what I think is going on. You have them here. Which things are the prayers of the saints? Both the bowls of incense and the harp refer to the prayers of the saints in both their spoken and sung forms. That's what I think he's doing. And you say, well, why would God use a harp to symbolize Christian prayers if the use of musical instruments was not acceptable in Christian worship? Why would he do that? Well, presumably for the same reason he used bowls of incense to symbolize prayers of Christians, despite the fact it's widely understood that burning incense to God is not acceptable in Christian worship. We don't have churches burning incense to God. Yet he uses that as a symbol. You see, the symbolic function doesn't require their actual use. Incense is a pleasing aroma, and thus it symbolizes that the prayers of the saints are received gladly by God. That's what is symbolized there. And a harp symbolizes the harmony of voices raised in song to God. So they are prayers spoken and sung, indicating that they are received gladly, and on the sung side, they are melodious or harmonious. Indeed, in Revelation chapter 14, 2, this is the only verse in Revelation that mentions playing of the harp. This is the only one that mentions playing of the harp. And John says, And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of thunder. The sound I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. They were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So here the sound from heaven that John hears 
In chapter 14, verse 2, it was very loud, being like the sound of many waters, like the sound, loud sound of thunder. And it was also melodious. You see, being like the sound of harpists playing their harps. It was not harpists playing their harps, but it was like it. You know, when somebody says, yeah, the tornado came through and the sound was like a freight train. Well, he's not saying it was a freight train. He's saying it was like a freight train. Well, that's what he's saying. He's hearing melodious singing that is like the sound of harpists playing their harps. How is it like it? It is melodious. It is harmonious. Ian Boxall, who's an Oxford theologian, in his commentary on Revelation, he says the sound from heaven here is probably a heavenly sound, loud as one has come to expect from the heavenly realm, but melodious nonetheless, for it is like that of harpists playing on their harps. Many waters describes the voice of someone like a son of man at 115, and the loud thunderclap has hitherto described the divine presence, but the sound of heavenly worshipers rather than God himself is more appropriate here. See, 19.6, where the hallelujahs of a great multitude will be described this way. These heavenly beings making this heavenly music were singing something like a new song before the throne and the four creatures and the elders. So since singing is analogized to harp music, right here in Revelation, I don't have to go far. It's analogized to harp music right here in Revelation, using a harp as a symbol of sung prayers seems perfectly natural in chapter 5 verse 8. See what I'm thinking about, he's got bowl of incense and a harp and I'm saying these represent which things are the prayers of the saints in their spoken and sung forms. Right here I see that the voice and the singing is analogized to a harp. So you know it, it makes perfect sense that that would represent the singing of the prayers. I don't think this is a stretch at all. It seems to me, in fact, I think it's dead on. All right, 15, Revelation 15, 2. John sees the victorious ones standing beside the glassy sea. And the text says, having harps of God. Okay, that's what it says. Having harps of God. Now, the Greek word echo, it can mean having or holding, having in the sense of holding something. It can mean that. Which is why in some translations they insert the words having in their hands. You see? Hands isn't in the text. The text is having harps of God. So if you think, well, having means holding, then they insert holding in their hands. Harps of God. But that word echo can also mean having in the sense of being equipped with. And it often is used of a person having hands, feet, ears, eyes. See, these victors, they're not said merely to have harps, but harps of God. They have harps of God. Now, I submit that rather than a picture of victors holding harps that have been given to them by God, this is a metaphorical reference to the victors having human voices under the direction of the Spirit of God. This is God's harp. This is God's harp because it is, for the reasons I've outlined, the music that is especially fitting for the worship of a God who is spirit. The vocal capacity, the voice, is God's harp. And as I just noted, there already is an association right in the prior chapter in 14.2. There's an association between the voice and a harp. See, there's that association right there. So this idea of God's harps, voices, harps, this is God's harp. Why would you think that would be a voice? Well, because I see that singing and voices are connected to harps, and this is God's harp. That's why. Moreover, you see that Revelation is apocalyptic literature. So this kind of symbolic imagery 
would be something that's right in place. And in fact, about a century after Revelation was written, a century a little bit less, Clement of Alexandria, he described the tongue as the psaltery, which is an instrument, the psaltery of the Lord. Harps of God. Psaltery of the Lord. What did Clement mean when he said psaltery of the Lord? He tells us the tongue. The tongue. In other words, vocalizing. This instrument that produces that sound. Now if Clement can call that the psaltery of the Lord, why is it surprising to think in apocalyptic literature the harps of God would refer to the same vocal element? You see this idea and this vocal capacity. In fact, Clement said the cathar, the harp, was the mouth struck by the spirit as if by a plectrum. And I will skip Athanasius or Hesuchius. There's a question about who owns that quote that I was going to read, but I'm uh, needing to go. Okay, now in addition, there's no mention of those harps being played, right? The text merely reports that those having God's harps are singing. Now given that the church never used musical instruments in worship and saw the human voice as best suited for worshiping a God whose spirit they were primed to understand in this vision that God's harps is a metaphor for the singing capacity of spirit-filled Christians. We have God's harp. You see, we're built with it. That's what I think he's talking about. Now, it's true that one doesn't see a voice, but John knew by the victor's triumph and singing that you see in chapter 15 that they possessed harps of God. Human instruments ready to extol him in heartfelt song. And John's description fits that knowledge. Now, in this series I've shared with you the fruit of my study that has convinced me that it's wrong, that it's sinful for Christians to worship God with instrumental music. And as I said at the, in the first session, this is one of those areas that to address properly, it requires one to take a broader theological scope and that's what I've attempted to do. I hope you've learned some things, and if nothing else, I do hope you gained a new respect for the a cappella position. It's not the result of brain-dead traditionalism, which is the impression you get in some quarters of the church. That that's all it is, just brain-dead traditionalism. That's not true. It is not brain-dead traditionalism. Rather, as I explained in summarizing the more common argument that is used against musical instruments in worship, Scripture shows that God cares about the way in which He's worshipped and He's revealed ways of worshipping Him that He accepts or desires. And given those two facts, it's more reverent to worship God only in ways He has indicated He desires rather than to worship Him uh, in whatever ways he hasn't affirmatively prohibited. Put differently, it's more reverent to stick with what God has revealed he wants than to innovate. You see, to worship him in ways that we want, ways he hasn't revealed that he wants. Now this argument, and I think it's weighty as I said, now this argument excludes from worship not only instrumental worship, not only instrumental music, but it excludes all human innovations in worship. All ways of worshiping God that he has not revealed he desires in the new covenant. Whether it be giving God a hand, clapping to God, flagellating oneself, cutting oneself, uh, burning objects, burning incense, shaking rattles, whistling, stomping your feet, dancing, any of that. You see, it all falls in the same category. That God has revealed ways he wants to be worshipped, and when we go outside of that, we risk giving him something he does not want, and we're doing it simply because we want to do it. And when we do that, that is less reverent than holding ourselves to what he has revealed he wanted. Because otherwise we're saying, what I want to do is more important than the risk of giving you something you don't want. All right, I went through that. So I'm showing when it's not brain-dead traditionalism. It is first you have this more common argument 
that you're familiar with. And in terms of the covenantal view of acapella worship, this deeper or additional argument that I've been focusing on, you see that instrumental music was a divinely prescribed part of temple worship, and it was closely associated with the offering of sacrifices. And Scripture teaches that the shift in covenants brought about by Christ included the abrogation of Jewish temple worship. And as the early church understood, that abrogation of Jewish temple worship, it included the material accompaniments of Jewish temple worship, such as vestments and animals and musical instruments and incense. These were all part of the shadows that gave way to the higher worship instituted by Christ worship in spirit and truth. This is by far the best explanation of the church's non-use of instruments from the very beginning. And I went through that. Now, for those who remain unpersuaded, and I'm not stupid, I understand, to change somebody's mind who's already had their mind made up is a virtual miracle. Okay? But for those who remain unpersuaded and who continue to believe that instrumental worship is acceptable to God, I want to quickly remind you of Paul's teaching in Romans 14 and 15. Assuming you're correct, and I'm wrong. Assuming that's the case, and instrumental music is indeed a matter of indifference to God. Well, Paul makes clear in Romans 14 and 15, and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, that love for your brothers and sisters who are not likewise convinced, whose consciences would be offended by using instrumental music, that requires you to abstain from the practice in their presence. And as I taught in September, I did two classes on Romans 14 and 15. So I can't go through all that now. But the idea is that when you have these matters of indifference, your conscience is free to do them, yet you have somebody else who has moral qualms about doing them. You cannot live out your wider conscience in their presence because you then risk pushing them to engage in the practice before they have the consent of their conscience and when they do that they sin because they violate their conscience and that can lead to a hardening process which destroys them which is not loving okay so even if you disagree you see you cannot do this kind of thing in an assembly that includes those who have moral qualms about it. And that applies not only to instrumental music. That applies, I heard that bell. That applies to anything about which your brothers and sisters have moral qualms. Now, there are some limitations on that that I went through in the class in September. I think you can find those classes online somewhere. But uh, I had a bit more to say, but in the words of Porky Pig, that's all, folks. <laughs>